because at the time, girls and boys were still coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, fucked up in all sorts of, oh, it's awful, awful. These wars, these unjust and illegal wars, it, it grips me. Chris, it really does. It grips me. And the first month of SES selection is, is just pure physical. The Royal Marines had to leave the Navy, join the Army. And when you join the Army, they had to have a parent uh, regiment to belong to. And, of course, that regiment was the parachute regiment. Mm -hmm. And if they failed selection, in theory, they would, they would get posted back to the parachute regiment. Can you imagine a Royal Marine in the parachute regiment? Spud, is there something about being in the regiment that makes people stay around Hereford for their after they've served? Um, no, well, I don't. I mean, I love it. I mean, I'm a city boy and I'm a country boy, but uh, no, I wouldn't say there's 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 not that much to keep the, the lads around here. I mean, as a percentage, I, I guess there's very few of us that live here. Um, most of the guys sort of move off back home. Or overseas, mm. you know. So, but, uh, no, I, I mean the camp is only uh, that's the crow flies about five miles from my place, really. Um, but it's nine miles away, uh, and I, I I'm on the flight path to the beacons. You see, so uh, I get a lot of I get a lot of the I get a lot of air, air, air I get a lot of air traffic sometimes, but uh, they don't fly low enough for me. They're always staying up high. I think they should get a bit of low level training. <laughs> So, Spud, how old were you when you joined the, 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 did you join the parachute regiment first? Yeah, I mean, um, I, um, I didn't get on, on, I didn't get on in school too well. And I always had this sort of rebel streak in me. And uh, I left school at, at 15. I don't know how many O-levels or uh, GCEs I took, but I do remember the day I left, my parents gave me a pound to give to the school so they could then send on my exam results. Now, I don't think they ever sent on my exam results. Well, my parents didn't tell me. <laughs> and uh, as a consequence, I didn't, didn't know if I had passed any exams or not. Anyway, so I got out into the big wide world and um, I, was, I was itching to go, if you know what I mean. Um, I, I had a couple of jobs. One job was working up in Spitterfield's fruit market. So I had to get up early in the morning and uh, drive from sort of Ompington Bromley area. And then four o'clock in the morning, all the way through up to sort of East End of London, through the Rotherhide Tunnel, and then start work. And I was back home in bed for about one o'clock that afternoon. Um, and I remember my dad lending me the money. He lent me the money to buy a moped so I could do the journey which was uh, an FS1E Yamaha moped. Um, fizzy. Like, eh? Fizz a fizzy. A fizzy. It was the purple one, so it was a sort of second generation. And um, it was 480-odd quid, which was a bloody fortune then. But my, my old man managed to raise the money to lend it to me. And he made sure I paid it back every week. Um, and I look back at it now, and I think that's a really good, that's a really good grounding. The fact that uh, he made me pay the money back, but also the fact that I had the, you know, the, the ability to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I mean, it was a horrendous drive, really, through the streets of London with all these heavy lorries going on. And um, after I'd done that for about a six or seven months, I had a friend that uh, <laughs> I had a friend that, that a school friend that joined the um, Royal Green Jackets, and uh, he he was home on leave one day. And uh, he sort of bumped and had a drink and he had sort of matured a lot. I mean, he was always a bit of a lad, but he had actually matured. And I said to him, I said, Richard, Dick, I mean, what's it like in the army? Because I'm getting pissed off around here, you know. And I was also getting into a little bit of trouble, um, sort of running with Southeast London Pack, the sort of 
nothing to do with drugs or anything like that, but just, you know, just being a, being a lad, being, being violent, I suppose. Um, and he said, oh, it's great. You know, it's really great. And you get three square meals and, you know, all that old nonsense. And you get money. You get paid as well for it. So I thought, yeah. And I said to him, look, what should I join? Who should I join? And he says, if I, if I had my charts, I'd join the Royal Marines. Oh, fuck, I, know. I thought, well, yeah, I want to see them. I want to join the Royal Marines. So what happened was I then went to um, Blackheath, which was uh, where the recruiting office was for the Royal Navy. We joined the Royal Marines. And, um, and I thought, went in there and these posters of these big blokes and stuff like that, you know. And I remember as a kid, I used to read these sort of commando comics and they were all about the Royal Marines. I mean, they were always smart looking and, and there was these bunch of guys called the paratroopers and they were always really rough bastards, horrible. So I went and joined the uh, Royal Marines and uh, you go in there, I did the fitness, did the aptitude. And I remember the Sergeant saying to me, right, go, go away, lad, come back at one o'clock and we'll let you know what, what the score is. I came back at one and he said, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got a police record. I said, well, no, I haven't. He said, you have. When you were 15, you stole a car. I went, no, I did steal it. It was my mate's car. He let me borrow it, you know. And it, why is it on record? Because I was told at the time it would never go on record, but it was on record. So they said, we can't accept you. You've got to go away for a year. I said, no, I want to join. I want to join. I, I said, what, what else can I do? He says, well, you can always go next door and join the paras. They'll have you. <laughs> so, because at that time, the Royal Navy recruiting office was next door to the Army recruiting office. So I went next door, joined the Paris, and they had me, and it was, that was it, you know. Um, really. Uh, I remember when you were leaving, when we were leaving school and lads would join the Army. It was just like such a, it was such a big thing. Yeah. You know, there's all of us doing all kind of shit jobs and... yeah. Trying to earn out, I think I was on 30 quid a week back then. And there, there were these guys coming back on leave and they had the crew cuts and, and suntans and they'd been out running with their yeah. troop and this kind of stuff. <coughs> um, yeah, it was quite, it's, it's a, it was a good option for a young person, wasn't it? Well, I joined in, wow, well, 78 and, um, it was either, for me, it was either go on, the, go in the print, or do what I was doing up at the markets, or go to jail. I mean, it was really that, that, that straightforward as far as I could see. I mean, I'd rather like to have thought that I would have been too clever to go to jail, get caught. But uh, you're always pretty smarmy and smart at that age, aren't you? Um, but yeah, I mean, I joined the Paras. Um, I went up. Uh, in those days, the, the waiting time wasn't like six, seven months, nine months like it is today. I mean, it was a matter of weeks. And I remember, even to this day, that, uh, uh, Jesus, I just wanted to get out. And it, I think it was only about four weeks I had to go up to Sutton Coalfield, you know, but it seemed like a lifetime. I, I, I went up to Sutton Coalfield, um, managed to get the unit I wanted, the paras. Um, I wasn't particularly fit, although I played rugby but I was sort of always built for sort of comfort, not speed. Um, so we went down to Depot Para and those immortal, that immortal phrase is uh, when you get off the train at uh, Aldershot, you know, Aldershot, Aldershot, this is Aldershot, you know, and you'll get out and, and the usual scenario, the bus is waiting. There's a couple of full screws there and they all usher you onto the bus and you go off and that's it. And um, I kind of, I kind of thought it strange for the first few months being running around or well, first few weeks running around being shouted at, but I kind of understood it. I couldn't get to grips with the fitness. <coughs> um, that was quite, that was quite, although I was fit through rugby, I couldn't get to grips with the fitness, all these long runs. Um, but I managed to get through it. All right. And I remember after about week six or is it eight, when you pass off, I don't know in the Marines, but you, I think week six or eight, you pass off the square. So you stop wearing these sort of cabbage hats and they give you a maroon beret, you know. <clears throat> um, and then they, uh, then what they called the uh, Hitler Youth joined us, the junior paras. You know, they'd been in since 16. So, I mean, they were like, they knew all the scams, all the score. <coughs> Excuse me. 
yeah, they they knew all the scams and all the scores. It was quite it was quite uh, interesting to see how they treated us. But I mean, they looked so young, and yet I was only what 18, 19. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, so I passed all that, and then obviously there's something called P Company. Uh, which is a series of uh, quite heavy endurance sort of events, physical events. And uh, one of them's the log race. And I actually got awarded the flag. And every every sort of event, you the best person gets awarded a flag. You know, the, I think it was a Pegasus flag or something. And uh, that's the first thing in my whole life. Anybody's actually given, I've won anything. You know, and, I, and that log race to me is, is, is an unbelievable feat of endurance. Yeah, the stretcher race and everything else, the phrenasium, the milling. But for me, that log race was something. It was the first time in my whole life that somebody actually praised me for something that, you know, that I, that I actually worked on. And that was kind of good. Uh, all through the rest of the, the training, the, the next three or four months, um, was, I found it. I found I, was, I was very, found it very hard to get into it all. But, I, but it suddenly clicked when we went to Advanced Wales. I never found the, uh, the the power training easy. I, I mean, I didn't slip into I didn't slip into it. It took me months to get into it, and it sort of clicked when um, almost to the end of the course, you do something called Advanced Wales, which is three weeks up in the Brecon Beacons, and it was winter at the time, and um, I, where you do all the tactics and the ambushes and patrolling, uh, and I it's kind of clicked in for me then. And I remember being two o'clock in the morning. And there was about four foot of snow on the ground. And we were dug in in a defense position on this thing called, with well, this feature called uh, Concrete Hill. There's no reason, you can't dig into it. You can get down, just take off the top layer of peat and you're there anyway. So anyway, we had snow and everything. At two o'clock in the morning, I was staggering on on the gun. And I was thinking, fuck, you know, this is, you just don't, you just, you just think, what the fuck are you here? And, uh, and you try and play it for real. And all of a sudden I got this, whack right under the stomach this corporal kicked me right in the solar plexus and he says wake up Ely wake up and I said no call or, you know call or staff I can't remember call staff I'm not I'm not asleep I'm not asleep but I wasn't asleep and then I remember a few years later I'm downtown in Hereford just past selection into the SES and I'm in this nightclub you know bigging it up and then this guy Vic Hazy's name was he come up to me and says Ely and he fucking punched me in the solar plexus. He said, well done, Ely. <laughs> he said, what squadron did you get? I said, D squadron. He said, well, I'm A. Now, fuck off. Laughing, you know, I mean, it was very, kind of a joke, really. Um, but that little incident always, I always remember it purely because when I talk to other soldiers, recruits about um, how difficult life is at the time, you'll always remember these certain things in your career that... Uh, like, I'm not saying Vic was a, a mentor, but uh, an incident like that always, I mean, from that early stage, and I, I didn't stop soldiering until I was about 50 odd. And I've never, ever forgot that, you know, about, I mean, s sleeping on stags, worse than having an ND, isn't it? I mean, sleeping on stag, you, you know, they used to they used to fucking shoot you back in the First World War. I mean, having a negligent discharge isn't, isn't so bad, but if you sleep on stag, and I've never slept on stag, and I've always, you know, it's always been good. <laughs> That's a good little uh, sort of story I always remember and always recall. I mean, I've got a nephew in three power at the moment, and um, he's doing well. So, and I recall, I recall that story to him years ago when he was in training, and uh, I think it stuck with him too. And then... We passed out. I got my maroon beret. I'm so absolutely, so proud. It was just unbelievable. And the powers are, have this this saying, which is called alley. It's an alleyness. I mean, the Marines have theirs, but we've got this saying: looking alley, looking smart, looking cocky. And powers are cocky. Powers are smart in the sense of they're combat smart. I'm not talking about you, Royal Marines. You look. We always were envious about you with your shirts and your trousers and all your your Gucci boot gaiters and stuff. <laughs> so we, we, I passed off and I felt so great. And we had these Paris smocks, which was different from the rest of the army. And we just we just felt so different. I went off to do the uh, parachute course up at Rise Norton. And on the third jump, um, I piled into the, to a pig farm. It was very windy, gusty winds. And um, I smashed my right shoulder 
snapped half a clavicle off it. So I spent uh, the December in hospital at RF Relton and didn't pass out with my platoon 449. I passed out with two platoons later, 451, um, which was kind of, I went all the way through with these boys. And, uh, you know, I had some great guys in 449, some which I'm still, you know, we talk to now. I passed out with 451 and then I got posted to um, Berlin. I got posted to two para, that was my battalion. And uh, they were over in Berlin. So I did the last couple of months in Berlin with two para. I did the last he uh, guard at Hess. You know, the old German Hess, Rudolf Ronolf Hess? Yeah, I do. The surviving Nazi bastard that the, uh, the Allies at the Nuremberg Trials, shows you how long ago it is, isn't it? <laughs> Nuremberg Trials are uh, allowed to live. I mean, I did the last British guard with two para on that. So um, then, of course, we, uh, we went on after Berlin, we had six weeks leave. Uh, and then we, got, then we prepared for a two year tour of Northern Ireland. And um, that was when the, you know, that's when you realize what war is all about. I mean, I spent two years in Ireland. I, it was just quite amazing. The, the pounding of the streets and all the sort of, all the ambushes we did, the patrols over in uh, bandit country, as they call it. Um, and then, and then uh, we had Warren Point. And uh, I caught the second bomb on that. I was in B Company 2 para down at Newry. We were the QRF. And it's where the IRA blew up uh, 18 of our guys um, at, at Warren Point, a place called Warren Point. They were, they were actually coming to Besbrook Mill uh, to do a resup, And they were, we were doing a company changeover. Um, and the strange thing was the, the guys in the four tunners were from 449 platoon, my platoon. And Barney, my best mate at the time, was killed. And Tom, my other best mate, Tom Caggy, still alive. Because every, every half hour, they, they were tailgaters at the four, on the four tonner. And as you remember, the four tonners used to spew all this diesel fumes up. And if you, if you sat in, in the truck itself, you uh, you'd get sort of you get you feel a bit choky, so the thing was it was always to get on the end of the tailgate so you get fresh air. So Tom had just changed with uh, Barney, and Tom was on the end tailgate. The, the first bomb went off, and uh, everyone in the truck got was blown to pieces, apart from Tom who was blown out. I mean, he suffered eighty percent burns from his neck downwards. I went to see him. Few months later in um, uh, Woolwich Hospital, and he was on a spit. They'd had him on this spit for six months, just slowly turning around, you know, because his body couldn't settle. I mean, how horrendous. Tom's alive and well now, and we, we, we're in regular contact. But the irony, of it, the irony of this little story was that if I'd have passed out through 449, I could quite well have been in the back of that four tonner, because mm. everybody apart from a couple went to B company, they all went to A company. It was A company that got hit at uh, Warren Point. Um, you know, I don't believe in conspiracy theories and I also don't believe in coincidences either in that sense. But um, yeah, that was, uh, that was an eye opener for me. And then the tour went on, we lost a couple of more guys. And then I, <laughs> on, on, with two para, we had a rotation system. You did a month in camp at Balakinle, and you did a month down at the, on the border. And on the rotation in Balakinle, Kent, which was the main secure camp where two para were, you know, were, 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 where the battalion was stationed, we had to do camp guard. And uh, one of the times, the officers and sergeants had this mess do, and uh, it was B Company again. And you have to, uh, you have to supply. The guarding company has to supply the sort of the waiters to wait on the officers and sergeants in the sergeant's mess. And uh, because I wasn't a uh, front of house type person, you know, <laughs> I wasn't a front of house type guy. They stuck me in the back in the kitchens along with this guy. Um, and uh, the guys, what was happening was we were, we were doing the Dixies. We were washing, washing up all the plates. And all the sort of uh, the clean cut lads would come in with these half, with these trays, with half drunken 
beer and vodka and wine. And there's me and this lad, Robbie Allison. We would uh, we'd, they'd, they'd put the trays there. We would wash it. We would drink. And then, anyway, we got absolutely shit faced and somehow ended up on the top of the officer's mess, um, throwing slates down on top of the through in the garden party. Uh, and that was it, mate. We got, <clears throat> they called the guard out. And because it was B Company that was securing the camp, it was the guys I knew. So the guy, the guard came out, they arrested me and Robbie, and the long and short of it all is I got 28 days in Nick. I mean, I could have gone to Collie. Robbie got 28 days as well, um, which is like a crazy thing to do. You've got an operational tour. Anyway, while we were in there, um, these two Marines turn up, and I don't know whether you know them, a guy called Dick Scott and Dave Slater. Uh, Dave Slater is a name from back Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> they turn up because they'd gone able and joined the foreign, uh, foreign legion because they weren't they they weren't allowed to go on the tour of Ireland that their commando unit was doing. So that, so obviously their commando unit was over in the irony of that is that they actually did end up in Northern Ireland. Um, they turned up and they did twenty eight days with me and it was so so funny. I mean it was a laugh a minute, and then I got. Uh, before I had my little sort of drinking episode, I was on what they call the drilling duties. So I was up to get my first sort of stripe. I was up to get a Lance Corporal. So I was on the Lance Corporal's carder. So um, the procedure in the Paris is you, you, you have a, um, you have an inspection in the morning and an inspection in the evening, about 1800 hours. And the duty sergeant major comes around and make, basically to make sure if all the prisoners are safe. And, and, the, and the, the system is, you stand at attention with the, within your bed space, all spick and span. And the sergeant major comes up to you and says, any complaints, any requests? And you go, no complaints, no requests, sir. And that's it. And that's standard thing. You just don't say anything. He came up to me one time and says, uh, any complaints, any requests? And I went, no, re no requests, uh, no complaints, one request, sir. He went, what, what the fucking request? Fuck, what do you mean? What's your fucking request? And after he calmed down, and Queen's regulation states that he has to take my request. I said, sir, I want to know if I'm still on the drilling duties. I want to, no, I want to, I want an interview with the uh, with the adjutant to, to see if I'm still on the drilling duties. Drilling fucking duties, drilling fucking Corporal Johnson, come and get this prisoner and go and beast him, sir. And at the time, the, the paras had this. You you had two items you had to carry with you all the time: a big wombat shell which was polished chrome, and he had a polished chrome para helmet, the old tin helmet, and you'd have to take that over the assault call. So he beasted me and beasted me. But I eventually got my request because they have to allow it. And uh, I, um, I went, got marched into the adjutant's office, and basically, you know, it was a no. But I just thought I'd ask anyway. So <laughs> but my 28 days in Nick taught me a lot about um, uh, how to keep fit. I mean, I was fit as fuck when I came out. At one time, they they signed me out because you're allowed to sign prisoners out to go and do menial tasks like area cleaning or something like that. So the um, one of the officers, I forget his name now, came and signed me out. I mean, we were playing rugby against three UDR, and uh, they signed me out. I didn't have any kit and anything, any like that boots. So they they, they quick marched me with my one back shell and my helmet. Left right, left right, left right, over to the rugby field. Yeah. No warm up, no training, fucking stripped off. Somebody threw a pair of boots at me. I got on, played the game of rugby, yeah, uh, made a try. I must say, I did score one, I made one. <coughs> and um, that was it. Put back on, you know, put back on, uh, stripped off on the, on the touchline and got marched back to the jail. And about an hour later, hour and a half later, I got this, somebody else comes out and says, right, you, well, we're going to sign you out. You've got to go down to the Plucky Pub. Now, the Plucky Pub on Ballykinley Camp was this old sort of plastic pub built, sort of, uh, you know, like a big bar it was on its own, uh, re reproduction type uh, English pub. So they, they marched me down there and I thought, oh, this is nice. I'm going to have a drink with the lads and stuff like that. And uh, no, it was to clean up the bar, you know. <laughs> it wasn't anything to do with, uh, uh, you know, having a drink with the team, it was to clean up the bar. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the two-year tour of Ireland really set me up for what soldiering was all about for me. Um, when we got back to 
the UK. Um, Colonel Jones, VC, uh, who then took over to Para, um, decided he wanted to form, reform the Pathfinders. Now, the Pathfinders was a special unit, um, basically during World War II. They, these are the guys that go, go ahead of the battalion drop and find a DZ and lay it. So then they could uh, bring the battalion or brigade drop in. A quite a specialist unit. It's like a mini SAS within a battalion. Uh, these days they have it at brigade level. But back, back, back when we came back from uh, Northern Ireland, they, uh, Colonel Jones, late Colonel Jones, wanted, uh, wanted to have his own eyes and ears. So there was a carder to do to, to see if you could pass to get into the Pathfinders. Um, I went on the initial carder and I passed. Um, kind of really enjoyed it because um, it was only half a company size, 50 guys, 55 guys with the H2 element. And uh, we were all fit and we were all keen and we were all sort of uh, uh, really professional. And I don't mean that in a bad way in the sense that rifle companies were. Of course they were. They had some outstanding NCOs and outstanding Toms. But we, we were this like band of brothers. I mean, we didn't do any of the marching stuff, which I kind of, in fact, I really liked. I mean, um, and if it, we would always be out training, we'd be on the, we'd, we'd be on the piss all night and we'd come back at six o'clock, we'd, we'd do a 10 miler. I mean, it was just amazing. And then Colonel Jones left us alone because he wouldn't want to see us on the parade square. You know, we're C Company, you know, and that's our oh, C Company's out training or they're doing this or they're doing that. Anyway, so, so, so that, was, that was fantastic. I mean, that was a fantastic sort of way of uh, getting away from the, 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 the drudgery of regimental life, which I never really enjoyed, but actually getting my hands dirty and, you know, doing soldiering stuff, which, which I really enjoyed. And also the camaraderie within the guys. I mean, it was a laugh a minute. I mean, because we were so fit. And I look back at it now and go, for fuck's sake, this is crazy stuff what we used to do. I mean, go downtown, get absolutely smashed. And six o'clock, you've got a, you know, you've got a 35, 50 pound Bergen on your back with an SLR, you know, they're, they're twice, the, twice the weight of an SA80 there, you know. And you're up and down and you're just laughing and you're, it's just amazing. Um, so that, that was it, you know. Um, how are we doing? <laughs> yeah, we're doing excellent. Did you did you have to train for any other kind of airborne insertion to be a pathfinder? I mean, do they do the halo this kind of stuff? Yeah, well, that's a uh, interestingly. Um, halo was uh, quite a unique um, asset to have, and only the SAS really did it. Um, I I did my halo course in. 1984, when I, when I was in the SAS. And when we, when Pathfinders, you've, you're correct in what you say, Chris, uh, when Pathfinders started, a couple of the lads did go for their halo course. I mean, the NCOs, I think the, uh, I think the boss went as well. But, you know, back at that time, I mean, halo was, was only reserved, like I said, for the SAS. And a lot of the PGIs up, uh, the RAF did it. Of course, they have to do it because they have to train us. But it was um, it was quite an unusual course to get on. Quite a, a very hard course because I think I think air assets at the time were, you know, weren't available. Um, but I did mine. I did my Halley course in '84 when I passed the SAS. You know, I mean that was for <laughs> I got I got so many stories on it. I just laugh, scared the shit out of me. But um, I'll try and keep this in chronological order, yeah? Yeah, um, go for it. Yeah, so, um, and I, if you want to, I can, you can stop, and I'll tell me to stop, so if you wanted to make a segment of it, then it's easy for you, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, right, yeah, the, the, the uh, C Company. Yeah, C Company was, was great, and I really got into the, uh, the tactical side of it. But there was something, there's something I needed more. And um, and I hadn't really. Th I thought about the SAS when um, when I was in Fort Kill in the in one of those locations in Northern Ireland on the border when the uh, Iranian embassy went on. I mean, that's really that's really all I knew about the SAS. Before that, when I was when I was working in the fruit market up at Spitterfields, there was an old boy there. I think his name was Tom, and somebody told me, "Oh, Tom." He used to he used to be in the SAS. He got captured and 
he got captured and spent his time in some salt mines in Russia somewhere. And I was, that, that stuck in the back of my mind, but I really didn't know what the SAS wanted. But I knew back in Aldershot when I was in the patrols, Pathfinders, that I needed something more. So I actually applied to join the SAS. And that's, that's like unheard of. I mean, unless you're a full screw and you've done like six, seven, eight years and you're the bollocks. So for me to apply and get accepted, because the CO has to, the CO of Two Power had to sign me off, uh, they can defer you three times up to 18 months, but he signed me off straight away because I thought they probably thought that, oh, oh, fucking Ely, he'll be back. And of course, once you leave the, the family, the parachute regiment, the battalion, you're fucked for, as far as promotion goes. I mean, I left as a Tom. <laughs> I, I'm still a Tom on their all back somewhere, you know, as a private soldier, you know, uh, don't matter if you retire as a full colonel, you know, you're still a Tom on their shadow rank, you know. Um, so they thought, oh, they'll be back when he comes back, we'll be fuck out of him. Um, but, but they didn't because they didn't come back. Um, I didn't come back until just before the Falklands. Uh, so I, I went and joined the, the SAS, did selection. And the first month of SAS selection is it's just pure physical. And uh, because because you have to because they have to accept ranks from all all units, from all for armed forces, um, the navy, you know, the air force, the army, and indeed the marines. Back at that time, the Royal Marines had to leave the army. <laughs> Even when they decided to go on the selection course, they had to leave the army. Come off strength from the navy. Uh, sorry, come off strength from the navy. Join the army, and when you join the army, they had to have a parent uh, regiment to belong to. And of course, that regiment was the parachute regiment. Mm. And if they failed selection, in theory, they would they would either have to leave the army, rejoin the navy, or get posted back to the parachute regiment. Can you imagine a Royal Marine in the parachute regiment? I don't think it's ever happened. But back in that day, they had to do it. Now I think it's a lot easier. Uh, the first month was all just all physical, uh, culminating in that uh, in the test week, five days over the hills. And um, out of uh, out of 186, out of 186 people that passed, um, there's only three. Only, sorry, I'll, I'll start that again. I'll leave that to the end. I'll come back to that um, because it's it's it, it, it kind of. It, it, it kind of works out for what I'm going to say to you. Right, the, the, the whole month, now the SES training, the initial month I found quite hard in the sense it was all physical. I mean, the first couple of weeks was pretty easy for me and it would be pretty easy for anybody that's in an infantry unit or fit. But as, but as it went on, the fact that it was physical, is it, it was physical, you always risk getting you know, an injury, like a twisted ankle or something like that. And it's, it's sod's law that, that most, some good soldiers have never never passed out in the SES because they, they got actually, they actually got injured. Um, and that's just the way it is. Um, so, yeah, and I remember standing there, and I'm, I'm a Tom, I'm a private, remember, and I'm standing there and there's all these ranks with all these fucking stripes on and there's sergeants. And, and you know, having been in th three, four years, you, pick, you know, because I was an old sweat, I kind of, you still respect the rank, of course you do. And these guys standing there with these British Army judo badges on and this and that and cross country runners and fucking Olympic, you know, Olympic trialists and all this nonsense. And you think, what the fuck's going on here? So I just cracked on and done it. I just got on with it, kept my mouth shut, played the grey man um, because... There's no point in being up in front and pissing everybody off because you only get noticed. Um, so I played the grey man, hung back, and just just bided my time. And I remember on third week, the build up to test week, we're up the Brecon Beacons, and um, the thing about the, the thing about selection is you get nobody shouting in your ear. There's nobody telling you, right, go to this, go to that, do this, do that, fucking shut the fuck up, you shut up, fuck off. Come here, cunt, and all this nonsense. Sorry, you don't have the C word, do you? <laughs> um, right. Yeah, okay, well, we will cut that one out. You know, come here, little scrote, and all this. It's all very much, look, here's your next grid. See you later. 
if you don't want to, if you don't want to go on, there's a whole brood waiting for you down there. And I remember seeing these um, these guides walking off the mountain, and then we have to wear these big burgers, but they've got these big fluorescent orange uh, air marker panels on the back. So obviously, if the weather went down, they could actually spot you. Uh, it quite easily so I remember looking at seeing these sort of every time I would get to a high point I'd look down and see oh yeah there's one just getting down there yeah and it just gave me so much boost and confidence to know that there were people jacking all the time and um, and that's what kept me going a lot and I remember go, 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 passing these guys and thinking what are you doing here you know and they were always they always double checking their maps and um <clears throat> They were thinking too hard on it. They were thinking too much into it. I mean, you had to go from A to B and that was it at a certain time. And yeah, seeing those Bergens heading off down towards the old uh, chuck wagon, the four tonner, you know, um, beautiful. It was just a beautiful sight. It gave me so much confidence and boost. And of course, when you did pass the particular phase on that day, um, because my, because we were stationed here in Hereford and not, um, and the trainee now is, is back down in Pontralis, which is, no, it's not at Sennybridge now, which is almost on the mountain training area anyway. We had this horrendous two hour drive up there in the morning and two hour drive back. I mean, in the back of a four tonner, Chris, I mean, it's, it's no fucking joke. I mean, especially if you're all fucked up and you're wet and you're stinking, you, you know, it really, really wasn't good. And then, um, of course, the last four tonner was always the blokes that had passed and made the time. And there's been sort of two or three, four tons that have gone back to camp. And um, of course, by the time you get back to camp, all the guys that are jacked are all, are all out of shower, all clean. Yeah. And they're all have had a scoff. And then the NCO would come around and each room, he'd, he'd call out the names. And he, the names he called out, you knew, were the ones that were going to get kicked off the course. And, <laughs> and I tell you, I remember it being in the shower with my mate Ken. And we're laughing, laughing and joking, and uh, the names being called out. We'd come back and with a towel around us, and like we'd walk in an eight-man rooms. So there'd be nobody left apart from me and Ken. I mean, it was just beautiful. Um, yeah. So on on that um, on that course, there was 186 of us, and um, only three passed. And there was there was me, a, a, a Tom in one in two para. There was uh, Elvis, Phil Priestley, a full screw in three para, and it was Chris Fox, Royal Marine Captain. Um, so that kind, that kind of was really good, you know. <laughs> yeah, it must be an in incredible feeling to pass, but it's not it's not a short selection, is it? It goes on, am I right in thinking it goes on for over a year? Yeah, well, it goes on for several months, and then you have an 18-month um, uh, probation period. We did lose, uh, for me, the hardest the hardest bit I found, um, well, I found it all hard, really. I mean, just go back to test week. Test week, the last day of test week culminates in a big march of the fan dance, and it's over the... It's right across, it's 60 odd miles, I think it is. It's right over the other side. It starts off at, starts off at uh, uh, Taliban Reservoir. You go right over the Brecker Beacons, right over the other side to Cray Reservoir, and you come back again at a different route. Um, hell, and when I did it, there was honestly three, four foot of snow. It was the first time snow had fallen in Brecon Village for about 20 years, mm -hmm. proper snow. And a consequence, you normally get um, on a, a winter selection, you normally get the um, 20, 22 hours to complete it or 24. And on the summer, it was 20 hours. Uh, well, what they did on, on my particular selection, and I'm sure they've done it since, is just say no time limit, just finish, just pass. And we were trudging through snow, waist high, four foot high snow across the bit and it was just amazing and um to pass that was i kind of felt special as well because you you then begin to feel quite special <laughs> in a way or just completely fucked <laughs> is it true there's no sort of ceremony you just get handed your berry or or, or your dad oh yeah yeah that's going back to um 
there was when me, Chris and Elvis were in there, we all had to wait outside the CO's office in Hereford and we're all having a laugh and a joke. And if you know, uh, Chris is like a real small guy, but uh, fit, probably the fittest guy I've ever met, really, because when he'd finished, uh, when we'd finished test week, him and his girlfriend went and did the seventh, is it five peaks mm. up in the Lake District? He went and ran them. Crazy, crazy man. Um, we're all outside. And then we get called in. We get called in together. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the CO's there with his burial. And we've got, I've got one maroon. Phil's got his on. And, and uh, Chris has got his, his burial. We're all standing there, you know. And he says, well, gentlemen, well done for passing. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, well done indeed for passing. And next time I see you, I want to see you with the correct berry on. And this, we get outside, fucking hats. <laughs> because if, if, your, if your viewers don't know, um, anybody outside the parachute regiment is called a hat, a crap hat. It's quite a derogatory term, but it can also be quite uh, an empathetic term for people as well. Uh, but, you know, so to call someone a hat, is, is, is to say, you fucking tosser, how dare you? Now, I get called a super hat because I'm up here. Yeah, they call, they call people in the SES super hats, yeah? But if there's any member, and I, I, I've never met a member of the, the SES who was at Parachute Regiment, They've always, they always call themselves Paras first. When I go on parades or, or go to any dues, I mean, I'll wear, my, I'll wear my SES tie, I would never wear my berry. I'll always wear my parachute regiment, Barry. Mm. You know, and I think you'll find 99% of all guys would do. In fact, all ex-paras would do that. I'm pretty sure it was uh, just one of those things, you know. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> even Chris was like, fucking tosser. I mean, that's the CEO of 22SAS we were talking. We just joined, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the, what's the um, timing then, Nigel, of the Falklands? Was this... Was this before? Yeah, what, the right, what happened was uh, I passed selection. Then you get a three week period of weapon training and stuff like that, ambush, basic patrolling techniques, purely because if guys that have come from core units like engineers or, or the REMI or even indeed the Navy, you know, they pass that initial selection, they need to have a grounding on, on basic soldiering because that's what the SDS is all about. It's soldiering, it's infantry skills. So they needed that. So that three week period was basically really for them and for us to, to get up on speed with ours, but for them to actually understand the basic of patrolling. We then went to the jungle for, oh, that was horrendous, for um, a month, basically it's about four weeks, at which point I, um, I slipped off a log and my shoulder opened up again and they had to casavac me out because of infection. I didn't want to go. I mean, I really didn't want to go. So they casavac me out. So as a consequence, I, I didn't pass selection on that phase. Um, but they said, you come back. So what happened was I then got RTU to back to two para, back to C company Pathfinders. Yeah. But I, I don't know about the, the CO at the time. I think he was taking the piss because uh, he made me bed installment. Yeah of the company, which was brilliant, really, because I had my own bunk, yeah? Uh, I mean, these days, I think everyone gets their own bunk. But back in my day, it was like eight-man room split with a petition with four in each, and there was, a, off to a side, there was a, there was a corporal's bunk. But on one, one particular floor, there was the bedding store and corporal's bunk, which was a, a double-sized corporal's bunk, so I managed to get that. So, so I was taking the piss out of... Uh, uh, been the, the mattress storm and what, while I recuperated because I still had this bloody th shoulder which is which was fest festering you know it's pussy um then we got the call to go to the Falklands and I'm thinking bloody hell I hope I don't get downgraded and I I try to sort of try to play the big I didn't want to be on rare party I wanted to go to war with the, with the blokes none of us really knew we were going to war we just thought it was a, you know, it'd be settled. You know, Thatcher and uh, uh, Alexander Haig, he was doing this shuttle diplomacy, wasn't he, from Bonnie's Aires to New York to London. And we, we thought it'd get, um, we thought it'd get a negotiated settlement. But as the weeks went on, um, the guys were training more and more. My shoulder was getting better, but it still wasn't 100%. I remember uh, tabbing with a field dressing over it. 
and uh, trying to stop it from weeping. Um, because I really didn't want to get downgraded. Anyway, the, the, the uh, OC at the time, the C company, Roger Jenner, absolute cracking guy. Um, when 3 Para got the order to go with the first task part of the task force, we thought, shit, we, you know, we, we, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be with the party. And then Colonel Jones, bless him, apparently um, decided to pull rank and got two para down as well. So we followed we we followed the, the main task force and three para. We're about uh, two weeks behind sailing. So Roger Jenner, the OC, said, "Spud, you're coming with us." I went, "Okay, lovely." So C Company was then because it's only half a company was split into two groups: patrols and recce. Now I was patrols initially before I went up to Hereford. But because there was no place in patrols, I got put in uh, to recce, which was fine because they're, they're just a mirror image of each other, you know, and everybody knows everybody. Um, so, yeah, so that was it. I, I, I uh, reverted my, my rank of mattress storeman and, <laughs> and got put into uh, recce. So we sailed down there, but my shoulder wasn't right. And I, um, I, I mean, I hit the beach with this shoulder, still an open wound. But thank fuck it was cold down there because obviously the cold... Uh, uh, compresses it and, and tightens it all up. You don't feel it so much. Yeah. Um, and then the R. Uh, do you want me to carry on about this? Or yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's hear it, but it's fascinating. I'm not trying to. I just you can pick out the bits you want because um. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. I actually got RTU to two power from the jungle. And then, as a consequence of that, went down, sailed on the Norland with two para back in my old, with my old uh, company, which was which was absolutely brilliant. Um, we, when we got down there, we, um, the Norland was was this uh, roll on roll off ferry, and it took us about six weeks to get down there. It's twenty six thousand ton flat bottom boat. I mean, it was just fucking horrendous, really. But the crew were fantastic; they really were, and. Um, when the time came to get into the landing crafts, um, we all sort of exited out the, uh, I went out the port, port loading door and uh, we were meant to be the second landing craft to hit the beach because we had, because Jones wanted his C company in with us. You know, he wanted to be with his, his C company, his boys, as, as he used to call them. Um, so we, we were meant to be on the second landing craft, but we were in these landing crafts early hours of the morning for about uh, three two or three hours fucking nightmare sloshing around wet feet waiting for the other guys to uh uh load onto theirs they were out the starboard side which was the leeward side which is the side with the wind so it made their task even difficult trying to get out and, and board but fair play to the the, the, the marine coxswains on there all marine coxswains i mean they were you know they, they 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 were good as gold they were they were really top guys um so then all for the, when all the landing craft were ready, we all then sort of shot off, as, as you see in the films, early hours of the morning, naval gunfire and all that, thinking, fuck, this is going to be horrendous. Because there was no firing back at us when we were still in the uh, landing craft, and we thought we were just going to get slaughtered when we hit the beach, you know, because that's, that would be the obvious thing to do, wouldn't it? You know how many aircraft, uh, how many, you, you'd know how many landing craft were coming towards you, and then you would just wait and, you just pick your time. You, wouldn't, you don't shoot at them um, unless you've got anti-aircraft or uh, naval guns on on board uh, on board the mount, up in the mountains. You just um, you just wait until they drop the ramp, and that's what we thought. Then we found out we were lead landing crafts. So that made it even worse. You know, I mean, that just oh, for fuck's sake, because the, the the landing craft that should have beached first got stuck in kelp, which is that seaweed stuff, which surrounds the shore uh, of the Falklands. So we hit the beach first, unopposed landing, thank fuck. Unbelievable. Uh, so we run up the beach, as you do. Um, we met with some SB, SBS lads and SES guys because they were monitoring the beach. And then um, we tabbed off up to, uh, up to Sussex Mountains, which was our first sort of uh, feature that we had to get go firm on. Uh, being C Company, we were then we went off to our own OPs further out overlooking sort of uh, Darwin and Goose Green. And uh, we spent several days and nights up there 
uh, in the OPs. And I do recall, I do recall after about the second or third day, looking down and seeing the, the, the attacks in San Carlos Harbour, where all the Navy were, and those Skyhawks and Mirages, Argentine Mirages, coming and bombing and strafing and doing hell. And I used to think, fuck, this is the Royal Navy. What the fuck's going on? We're losing this fucking war. We haven't even seen an RG. And now they're strafing and the bomb's going out. I remember seeing the antelope go up. Oh, you know, if I've never seen, well, there's no reason for me to see bloody ships go up unless you, you watch the old uh, war movies. Um, and when that went up, I just thought, oh my God. And then the Sheffield and then the Atlantic conveyor, uh, 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 you know, and just all those naval ships getting smashed. And we thought, this is fucking stupid. We're actually losing the war. We're freezing to fucking death. Blokes have got trench foot. <coughs> the Marines and fucking three power are stuck on the beach. It sounds a bit like <laughs> sounds a bit like Normandy, doesn't it? They're stuck on the beach. Nobody can break away from the beachhead. We're stuck on this mountain. We've got to do something. And I think, um, and I've spoke to uh, um, Julian Thompson. Uh, spoke to him a few years back about this. And uh, he was really, which, which was the Royal Marine Brigadier of, of um, three, three Commander Brigade, wasn't it? Yeah. And he was so embarrassed because he couldn't get his mechanised, he couldn't get anything going. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Because obviously the, the, the important thing were the two aircraft carriers. So all the focus was on them. We couldn't get any, we couldn't get any top cover at all. <coughs> so I, I believe there was some crosswords between Jones and... Uh, um, Brigadier Thompson, and um, we were then told to go and uh, have a look at this settlement co called Goose Green. Um, so we advanced to Goose Green via a place called um, Camilla Creek House, which is just an old farmstead, where we sort of laid up there, the whole battalion laid up. Uh, and I remember being on the 320 radio because C Company had these 320 radios per patrol. And uh, tuned in, always tuned into the World Service. And then I heard this guy, John Knott, who was the Minister of Defence for the Tory government at the time, saying, the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, is poised and ready to attack the settlement of Goose Green. I mean, Goose Green lay two and a half miles in that direction. And we're at night. This is at fucking seven, eight o'clock at night time. And we... We, we're going to attack first light. So he's actually warned them. Now, you try finding, you try finding that broadcast. You won't find it anywhere. I've asked for a freedom of information three times from the BBC. Each time they've come back. No, twice they came back making out some cock and ball story that I'm not this, I'm not that. Then I told them I'm a journalist and I want it because I'm writing a book which I am, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them because it's in, the, it's in their archive somewhere. Anyway. So they basically so, broadcast the enemy that you're putting in attacking in the morning before, before the attack. It's, it's, it's oh, it was, it was so, ultimate betrayal. It was so demoralising. It was... Jones was said to be incandescent with rage. I mean, apparently he never really had a... He, he always had a short fuse anyway, from what I can make out. But he was incandescent. And Dave Wood, who was the adjutant, was in this uh, meeting that um, that Jones was giving to, to the commanders. And he came out and he said to my mate, Duke Cowan, who was a Lance Corporal in the, he was in the MT section and all the MT boys were actually the stretcher bearers, you know, in war. And uh, they're normally the characters. I think they're the characters of any battalion, really. They're the guys that are seen and done it, but just want a bit of an easy life. They kind of like the idea of messing around with vehicles. And he came, Dave Wood, the adjutant, came out and said to Duke Allen, he said, he said to the words of, um, gentlemen, oh, how do you, what's he say? Oh, yeah. He said, gentlemen, tomorrow morning, the promotional. Uh, I'll get this right for you. He said the promotional. It'll come to me. Basically, he was saying. He was saying. I'm trying to think of the word, the promotional. Opportunities, it's not the word he used. 
the, the promotional opportunities are going to be. I'll try and do that again for you. Um, I'll tell you okay. what, Spud, just one second, mate. Oh. No, I've got, I've, I'm just looking for it now. <laughs> Hold it. You want to have this one? It is good. I want to. Uh... There we go. Oh. Whose name and we'll find out. We'll find out something. Yeah. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, perfect. You can't see me though, can you? Yes, I can. You can. Okay. Um, well, I'm trying to. Okay, this is from Duke Allen, who was uh, MT, but they're the uh, defense. They were defense for two down south. They got renamed. And he, he, said, he said to me, it was on the night before Goose Green, we heard the radio broadcast from the BBC and that guy, John Knott. We've all stood about in a small gang alone with Captain Adjutant, with uh, Adjutant Captain Wood, um, which his name was uh, Adjutant uh, Captain Dave Wood. We were all standing around waiting and listening to the BBC World Service when we heard a voice out of the radio grasping, grass, grassing us up and basically Captain Wood came straight across to us and says in no he said and says to no one in particular gentlemen the promotional prospects in this battalion tomorrow are going to be fucking excellent and the irony of that is uh, Chris he got killed a few hours later oh my god yeah you're down there you're about to it's the pinnacle of anybody's military career. You're actually going into battle. You're facing a determined enemy. They're dug in. They're yeah. in a, a far more extreme numbers than you. Yeah. And you're a bloody, not far off a teenager, I'm guessing. And yeah. you're about to set foot up that mountain. And you know not all of you are coming back. Not amazing. Some, yeah. some of you are going to, you know die on that mountain and stay there the bbc broadcast to the enemy that you're coming it, it's it 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 doesn't get worse than that does it uh, no uh, especially when um when it was you, you know it was gusting minus 20 degrees you know it was just unbelievable uh, yeah so i kind of like that and Captain Wood came straight across to us and he says to no one in particular, gentlemen, the promotional prospects in this battalion tomorrow are going to be fucking excellent. He got killed a few hours later. God. You know, I, this, uh, I've got some cracking stories from the book on that. But uh, yeah, so that's what happened. Um, then C Company, being what they are, we went and... Um, Go and have to set the start line for the battalion attack. Now, for guys that are listening and girls that are listening to you, you you have to have a start line to do an attack. It's an imaginary line on the ground where a battalion lines up ready to go and advance to contact. Uh, that line has to be found. And uh, that was my task for a company to go and find the start line, a, a stop which is uh, close to enemy, but not close enough for them to see you or hear you. Um, so uh, myself and uh, my little patrol with a guy called Ken Rayner, who was a full screw, we led A Company into the attack. Uh, then other parts of C Company led B Company to their start line and then D Company. Um, a Company were the first to attack. They attacked a position called Bocker House. Now, of course, once you attack, you... You obviously your your um, element of surprise is gone, obviously because you start shooting, and anybody for fucking miles around knows that something happening. So they started to attack. They took their position, um, and um, a, a company attack. First company attack the parachute regiment had done for I don't know probably since since Radfan or something like that, and um, no one was killed. There's been absolutely few crazy stories there. But what happened was the Argies had bugged out a few minutes before. And um, and it was a night attack, so there's Shamuli's going up. There's, and, you know, there's machine guns going off, a typical sort of 
night attack tracer going all over the place, people shouting, people screaming, grenades being, being thrown. Um, and it was all over in about sort of uh, three or four minutes. And then you hear these Spanish voices and um, they're like, guys are going, the fuck's that fucking argy? Put your hands up, you know, put your hands up. And it turns out that there's, there's these three, three homesteaders in there, yeah, and a dog. And one of the blokes says, why the fuck are you speaking Spanish? Oh, we don't know. We thought you were Argentinians. <coughs> now we're fucking too para. You know, that was... Uh, but the strange thing was, before that attack, when we laid the, when we laid the start line, obviously we, we then had to pull back a bit. And um, it was really, really blowing a gale. And um, we all got all around defence. And then I heard these squeaking tracks, like, like a tank coming. I thought, fucking crazy. I let listen and listen and listen. As you know, you you know, sound travels a long way in, at night, but it, was, it sounded really, really close. Um, and the only track vehicles we realised the Argus had were these things called LVTP7s, which were like American, they were American designed troop carriers, carried about, I think, 20, 20 soldiers in. And uh, I think they had some machine guns on top and everything. The tracks, track vehicles. Anyway, this thing didn't appear, but we all got round defence and we got the 66s ready, which is a, a, a throwaway uh, tank tank bazooka, mini tank bazooka, uh, mini tank rocket, and um, which were a bugger to, once you've, once you've extended them, you know, you fire them off and then you just chuck them away. You, you can't refill them. But if you, for, if you extend them and try and... And if you don't see your target, you need to sort of collapse it and bring it back again because it's concentrated. It. It's quite hard to do it even during the day. But at night with gusting winds and all the tension around and the, the attacks are ready to go in, you know, it's really hard to do. Um, so that's something that stuck in my mind as well. Knowing that at night you need to know everything about your weapons you'll carry. You need to know every little crease everything about it. You need to know all the idiosyncrasies of everything that's going to protect you. Your webbing, your kit, you know, where everything is, where exactly where everything is. Yeah. Uh, and in particular with your weapons, you need to know where the safety catch is and how sensitive or not it is. You need to know what makes a noise, even when you, you even when you think it doesn't, you know, all these little things are all part of soldiering. And you know, you only learn these as you go through in life and you're in these situations. Everything is so down to the millisecond. It's no good you patrolling with your safety catch on and your point man, and all of a sudden, you know, you see the enemy. Because that's all it takes. It doesn't take a second. It takes a split second. It takes half a second. So I was aware of that. The attack goes in, and then um, come first light, A company then move forward, and they hit this position that the SAS had done a recce on a month previous. Uh, but we got no recognition of the intelligence of that. And I've, I've interviewed guys that were on that since, and they've told me they pushed all the intelligence over to command, to the brigade, and it didn't filter down to us. Anyway, so A Company going, do you want me to go through this? Yeah, thing? yeah, you're doing wonderful, mate. Absolutely. Do you want me to? I mean, because I can, you just tell me. Oh, big. I'll try and cut it down. So, um, once once a company had taken their position, if we but, so if we if we don't get this down right, it's it's lost to history, and and that's a bloody shame. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't want to. Um, I, I want to give it its gravitas, uh, and uh, you know, I don't want to sort of short it. I mean, that's why I've got the book. That's why I've got Goose Screen Uncensored Stories, the book, which. Which would be good, because I mean I can, you know, as you probably <coughs> probably know, I can talk about any subject you want. Um, but if your if your viewership is mainly military, yeah, we're a bit across the board. But yeah, I challenge anyone to not find out what it's like as a young man, you know, having to get stuck into that battle and, and yeah. thought processes your kit. Your worries, your fears, your how was it yeah. with, your, with your buddies, um, and and yeah. uh, to to lose people as well, which is you know the 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 bitter end of war, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
no. Okay, then. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it succinct, but, you know, keep it going. Um, so after A Company put their attack on Burnside House and followed, followed through, uh, B and D companies were coming across on the right flank, but their, their actual um, positions were a series of Argentine, supposed Argentine trenches. And um, as the Bocca House attack went in, then B and D Company came under fire too from these sort of line of trenches, which, and we're talking a mile and a half from Goose Green, and we're talking about uh, 500 metres from a feature called Darwin Hill, okay, which is a sort of a, a rolling pimple in front of Goose Green. I mean, we're heading south. We've got the sea on both sides because it's an isthmus. We've got the sea on both sides. The isthmus is only about half a mile wide, okay, Darwin Hill was right by the sea on the left. Uh, Bocker House was right by the sea on the right. And you've got basically a line of extended, uh, extended line of paratroopers, A Company on the left, B Company in the middle. Wrong, B Company on the right, B, D Company in the middle. They did change later. Um, and you've got C Company now coming as reserve company, we're only half a company strength. So we're bringing up the rear. So as light starts to uh, come in, and in that part of the world, it normally gets like about 10 o'clock in the morning because it was, uh, it was May time. And um, there was a bit of a firefight going on to the high ground to my left. OK, there was a field sporadic fire going and uh, thinking nothing of it, you know, just probably taking out a century, an Argentine century. And all of a sudden we got rained down with mortars. I mean, literally, they just came down on us and you could hear them because they make a plot and you can basically, sometimes you can see them as well. Um, and they just come down and hit, just came rained us all. They kept, they caught us out in the, in the open. Uh, and the only thing that we could do was run forward to the feature of the bottom of Darwin Hill. Now, before that, we all hit the deck and there were, there were mortar rounds coming down. They must've been over a period of about three or four minutes, 30 rounds come down. Some of them weren't going off. One of them landed right between my mate's feet, literally, uh, within about four foot away. It just went into the into the peat and didn't explode. Um, a few of them hit the rock because basically the terrain was all tufty grass with rock. Uh, and I decided, I just went, fuck this. I said, right, I'm going to move. I'm going to move on three. One, two, three. And I got up and ran. And all of a sudden, my mate J.Y. shouts out, spud. And I turn around, I can see this. <coughs> I just see it. Well, I thought I, I thought I saw it. I stopped and it exploded probably about 10 feet away from me. And it was all tampered by the peat. But this piece of shrapnel came out in slow motion, but it must have been going a fair few, you know, fair speed. And it comes straight across my thigh, missed it by an inch, at an inch. I just kept running. These are these small margins in war that a million soldiers could tell you about that's happened to them. That happened to me. We ran into dead ground and then there's nothing we could do really. So we got a brew on. A company advanced up this hill and were fighting and you could hear it. But there's no point in us doing absolutely anything because they have to get on with it. B and D company over to the right were still advancing forward not so heavy fire at, at yet. And remember, Goose Green is still a mile and a half away. Um, round about 11 o'clock, there was such heavy gunfire going up on the top of Darwin Hill. We decided to advance around a bit to see if we could support them in any way. And then basically, it, bang, it was over. Uh, we moved up to the top of the hill and A Company were all out. There was these fucking argies dead bodies splattered, guys crying, RG prisoners with their hands up, field dressings, our guys fucking dead. Um, just, and we walk through this position and we're thinking, fuck, you know. And then somebody comes up and says, oh, fucking Stevie Pryor's got it. I went, oh, for fuck's sake. Stevie Pryor's a great force group, you know. Then Chuck Ivan's got it. Oh, the Colonel's been killed. Dave Wood, the adjutant, killed. Chris Dent, two I C of A Company, killed. Uh, you know, the names just went on and on, and you're thinking, and there's still fucking Argies in the trench. 
And you still got to be aware because, you know, you don't know if they're going to kill you or if they're going to have a nervous twitch or something. And it was literally just getting, it was first light by this and the, the sun hadn't actually started coming up, but it was, the, the area was grey and the phosphorus grenades that we'd thrown had, had set this gorse on fire. Gorse is this, is this bush that covers most of the Fulton Islands and in this particular time of year, it, 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 it flowers a lovely yellow flower. And uh, that was all on fire. So that was all adding to the tension. Um, the, the, the CO, the OC of um, a company, Farrah Hockley, was in uh, having a little Chinese parliament with Colin Price, the sergeant major, and there was a bit of shouting going on there. So you're thinking personalities, tension high. Um, people, a couple of blokes missing, Monster Adams, Steve Tuffin missing, presumed dead. Um, so this list of guys come come through, uh, gets passed over by people. Another another guy, Ted Barrett, comes over as a sergeant, says to my mate, you know, Ken, can you come on out? I'll come on out, fine. We're missing so and so. And Ken says, look, we gotta we gotta go to forward slope. We gotta we gotta hold this position. So as we move forward, this as we move forward, as we move through a company's position. And I mean, it was just, I mean, when you start seeing blokes crying in a war film, you think, oh, fucking wankers. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, some of these guys were young, they were 18. And they'd obviously been through this real traumatic experience. I mean, literally, they're, they're sitting down there with these fucking dead arches all over the place. And I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> you know, oh my God. <laughs> um, so we, we, we're told to advance to the forward, to the forward part of uh, Darwin Hill, which then overlooked Goose Green. So we're advancing and the rest of the guys, the battalion are clearing up, doing ammo restats, uh, getting, getting the wounded, you know, the injured and, and all this business and doing body counts and um, uh, shoving off these, uh, RG prisoners and stuff, and who, who, as far as I can make out, were proper soldiers. I mean, they were the, they were the they were the proper dude on top of that on Darwin Hill. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they were all conscripts. I don't fucking think so, but I mean, even a conscript can pull a trigger. Um, so yeah, so we move on. We move on ahead to secure the the, the, the southernmost part of this feature, and uh, we get there. And I'm, I'm, this is billiard table. Uh, sort of land that just goes all the way down into Goose Green like a flat as a pancake and the settlement you can see but to the right and forward is the <coughs> excuse me is the airfield and there's Bacaras on this fucking airfield these Bacaras are turbojet ground attack aircraft I mean they're just absolutely horrendous pieces of kit we were more scared of them than the Mirages or the or you know or the, the Skyhawks and uh, I'm thinking, fuck, you know, what is going on here? All the screaming and nonsense is still happening behind us, but we're having to focus on fr in front. Um, and then I can see all these hundreds of them, all on the airport, which is a grass strip, really, and all in front of Goose Green. And I'm thinking, fuck, can't they see us? Why aren't they firing? Because we didn't know at the time, but they had these uh, Orlikan guns. 30, 30 mil cannons, anti-aircraft guns. Well, you would do if you got an airfield, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd secure it with these anti-aircraft, which they later turned into the ground roll, into the ground roll, and started firing at us. Plus, they also had those Beaufort guns. They took off. I've never. The only time I've seen Beaufort guns is on World War Two. You know, the World at War Jeremy Irons documentary. You know, where the Navy boys are on ship and they put these magazines of shells down. Boof, 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 and they come out like that. Well, they had a couple of them. They'd taken them off ship and they had them in the ground roll. Of course, we didn't know about that until um, we started to advance. But anyway, I see all these argues and I'm looking around and I see my mate Charlie. I say, Charlie, why can't they see us? He says, well, I don't know. He got the binoculars out. Well, Ken did because, you know, there's only one per patrol. And he says, yeah. He says, they're argies. They, they think we're argies, he said. They must do, otherwise they'd be firing at us. Then, then Ken sees the guns. So that was it. We, about an hour later, well, it wasn't, it was about 40 minutes later because they wanted to keep the momentum going. Uh, Chris Keeble, two, the 2IC of 2 para, took over, Major Keeble. And uh, basically, we had to keep the momentum of the battle going 
and C Company had, were ordered to advance down this slope while D Company and B Company, who were still fighting their own little uh, fights with trench, uh, excuse me, with trench positions over to the right. So Ken says to me, right, Spud, we've got to go down the slope. I said, you're fucking kidding me, aren't you? He says, yeah. He said, you're point man. Because I'd been point man with Ken previous, you know, and I guess, I guess he could trust me. Because point man is, um, you got you got to be semi-switched on. And I, you know, it was just one of those things. Um, so I said, oh, for fuck's sake, Ken. He says, yeah, he says, it's got to be, you, you're first. And basically we went down the forward slope of Goose Green in what they call an arrowhead formation. So there's me at the front, two guys behind me, then four, then six or eight. And then it sort of went out like an arrow, a, a wide arrowhead. And at, at a distance back, probably 30 feet would be the HQ and the signals element with the Major Jenner, Roger Jenner. So we advanced the contact like that. Um, I fixed bayonets. Um, and then you heard this fucking spuds fixing bayonets. And you heard this clink, 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 clink. And everybody else was fixing bayonets because I thought, you know, what the fuck? You could see these sort of command tents in front. Well, about three, 400 meters in front of us, well before the main position of Goose Green. So you just advanced to contact like, um, like, like you just think this is the end of the 20th century. Isn't there an easier way of cleaning up this position? So we advanced. And all of a sudden, there's something happens. There's some, some shots happened and everything else. So we all, they opened up with the Orlikan guns. They couldn't get the both. I realized later they couldn't get the Bofa guns in the trajectory to, uh, they couldn't get them down much because we were coming down a forward slope. So they were firing up at the top of the hill at Darwin. So I ran like hell. Um, and then we got a load of casualties got hit in uh, the, H the HQ element. Um, three, platoon, three platoon A company came to support us because, like I say, we're only half a company straight. So they came up to, to bolster up our ranks. So they were behind the HQ company of uh, the HQ element of C company. But as soon as the firing started, they got caught out in the open and basically scrambled back the other side into dead ground of, of, of Darwin Hill feature, which left the HQ element out. They all got smacked to pieces, injured, uh, um, some very badly. One guy was killed. My mate Charlie was left in a, had to look after him. Um, and then he died. And then they had to work on another guy. He died. Uh, you know, another guy, the OC got hit and he was working on, he was working on the blokes. I mean, the whole of his HQ party basically got hit and you could hear it on the radio. Contact weighed out. Contact hit. I'm hit. I'm hit. You know, and it's real. I didn't know anything about that because I run like fuck. <coughs> I'd run like hell into dead ground. And then we came to this, we came to this uh, stream and the sea was to our left. And there was this wooden bridge which crossed the estuary, and there was this sort of big wooden feature which was the schoolhouse. And then um, there's actually no way we would cross it on that bridge. So there was a sort of uh, a roadway as the cove, as as the strip, as the re-entrant went into a bit of a, a a river, then a stream. There was a a, a road bridge across this culvert. So we managed to cross there, and we got into this area around the dairy, and there was fucking orgies everywhere, and we there were blokes were just they were popping out of everywhere, and you were just having to take them out. I moved into a trench, which I thought was command trench, threw a white foss into it. And of course, these white foss grenades were like we called them fused instantaneous. Because as soon as you, you threw them, they've gone. So we didn't know that until a company started throwing them and then warned everybody else. Um, but I didn't think it would be that instantaneous. Going out, went in this tent that was off, that was on fire, shot it up, moved to another one. And there was this other trench where there was a dead RG in it. And I moved in to jumped into it. And, and I thought there was, and I felt something. And I thought this, I, I don't know if this lad was dead or not, but he felt, he felt squidgy, if you know what I mean. And I ended up headbutting him. 
like you know, real, real. But I think about it now, and I think, like, um, yeah. So I, I sort of put the head on him a few times. His, his mucker was dead, and then you just carry on. And then the, then we got C Company got fractured, because by the time we got to the estuary, patrols went left. Recce were all over the place. There was, a, there was a kiddie swing outside the school, and the Argies had put this multi bowled rocket launcher tied onto it, obviously fire it remote. So old, uh, we sort of made for that. And then as we were going, a lad called Jock, Jock Boland, turned around and says, they're coming behind us, they're coming behind us. And as he turned to sort of turn around, this fucking rocket went right across him from this swing, from this multi barreled rocket launcher, and one of the fins sliced his chest, chest open. So he's there on the ground, fucking lung hanging out. Blokes are trying to sort him out. Another guy goes down, gets shot. Uh, all, all this is going on for about an hour or so. We, we're actually trying to move. We're trying to penetrate through into these positions of these arches. Next minute, we go and attack the schoolhouse. Patrol's done a good job on that, um, which there was about 80 arches in there firing across us. So that, that had to be taken out, um, which was... The schoolhouse was the biggest building on the islands at that time, um, but it was all made of wood. So I was up past the swings and I heard of the attack and there were some boys from D Company that came across as well. And I fired my 66 onto the roof because I could sit, make out the right hand side of the roof, but it just bounced off. And then somebody else fired another 66 and, and went into one of the windows, set it on fire. A few of the other boys, we had these M79s, we call them the plot guns. You know, they fire the N79 40 mil HE grenade. They were firing them in. And as the Argies, as, as the schoolhouse went up on, on fire, the Argies were escaping out the back and because it was right by the scene, down the re-entrant, down the, down the, behind the estuary and onto the beach and obviously back down into the goose green. And that's where the folks had a bit of a turkey shoot there. Uh, I'm sorry to say, use those phrase turkey shoots, but I mean, they're, they're, to be realistic, you have to use that because that's what it was. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, you look back at it now, 40 years later, 38, 39 years later, and I've got no regrets on anything I did there because at the same time that's happening, my mate Mino, who's a young 18-year-old lad, had the problem with the uh, white flag, literally 50 metres to my right. He was part of D Company. They were, they were going to come over and give us fire support for the schoolhouse. But he didn't make it because um, the Argies had a big Argentine flag up. Then they, then they uh, a couple of them stood up, apparently with some white kecks around a stick, wanting to take a surrender. Now, there's a bit of controversy there because... Um, a couple of the lads went up to take the surrender uh, from, uh, I think it was, I, I'm not sure what platoon it was in D Company, but the, the, the officer was Jim Barry. He went to take the surrender and um, Mino was saying, don't fucking go up there, boss, don't go up there. So he went up there and uh, Paul Sully, Corporals, good mate of mine, Sully, and Mino, uh, not, uh, not Mino, Nigel Smith went up, Lance Corporal, with the boss, with Jim Barry. And uh, basically they got wiped out. They got wiped out. Uh, and because Dave uh, Minnock, Mino, was meant to give us cover and fire in the schoolhouse, he couldn't, he had to then turn around because he's seen the Argies laughing at him. The Argies were laughing at Dave. He, that's what he was telling me. He said, they were laughing at me. He said, oh, I'm 18. I went to fire it and the gun went click. And, he, and Dave said, I started crying because I couldn't support my mates. And somebody shouted to him, you know, get the SPW out, spare parts wallet. And he did. He managed to clear the gun and get it, and he started shooting. And they sort of took out these arches with the white flag. Uh, not before three of our guys got killed under the white flag incident. Um, Jim Barry fell on the barbed wire fence. And uh, after, uh, after a short while, after the arches had been all been shot, um, Taft Meredith, who was a sergeant, it was a sergeant at the time of, I think it's Temperton, uh, went up to Jim Barry and said to it, and, and Dave Mino, the machine gunner, 18 year old, was telling me the story that 
Taff was talking to Jim. He was saying, sorry, boss, I've got to talk. I've got to take your map. I've got to take your binoculars. I've got to take your compass, you know, and um, I'm going to look after the boys. They'll all be all right. And old Dave says, he went up to Taff and went, is he still alive then? Being an 18-year-old, is he still alive? And, uh, and uh, Taff went, no, no, he's not. He's dead. Why are you talking to him? Well, it makes me feel good. I mean, beautiful little story in the middle of war. Um, so what happened when that white flag happened? Then we did the schoolhouse. We were, we ended up with about twenty odd twenty odd RG prisoners down by a little stone building called the, the Dairy, which is by this bridge we'd all gone over. And um, I later found out that the area we were attacking, where the Argies had dug in, was basically a pig farm, and they'd used they'd used all the pig styes as they turned them upside down and they'd used it as and dug them in as overhead cover from protection. So there's all these trenches all around there. And the arches were all over the place. I mean, and then we were getting shot at by our own blokes from behind because they couldn't make out who the fuck was who the fuck we were. Um, and after about 15, 20 minutes after after the, the white flag and then the uh, the, the, the um, schoolhouse burning down, <coughs> sort of I and a couple of other guys had gone right forward because we wanted to see Goose Green and wanted to see what the score was. And there's no way we could have got into Goose Green because there was just too much fire. It's, you just couldn't get, the archers were firing everything at us. I then came back and seen all these prisoners all laid out down by the, um, uh, what they called the dairy on the track. And there's this one poor old Argy. He had his leg, he had his leg hanging off. Uh, one of the guys had to cut it and put the skin up um, and then Dick Morrell who was our medic he was in the dairy patching up all the guys I mean we he patched up a hell of a lot of guys Arges as well he did um, only a small building probably about 24 by 12 stone built um, and then this Argy officer was standing up and we were telling him to get down or someone well, I wasn't telling him to get down um, Dick came out seen this RG with the no legs, said, I want this man up here, I want to treat him. The RG officer said, no, the RG still had his pistol. The RG still had his pistol. And then one of the blokes was going to shoot him, going to shoot me. And then Dick said, no, no. And Dick butt stroked this officer. Yeah. And then at the same time, somebody shouted air raid warning red, which meant enemy aircraft coming in. Then somebody on the right, they came up from behind us. They come from the north. So they come up from behind Darwin towards us. Um, they came round and um, they just let cannons rip, shot up every. The irony of it is they shot up all the arges up the track because they were on the track. Obviously, the pilots had lined up on the track. But the funny thing was, well, not the funny thing, the strange thing was 30 metres further on was half a D company all lined up on the track. Uh, luckily, no one got it. Um, they came round again. And then they dropped napalm. They, they came around again. One of them dropped napalm. And uh, it dropped past the dairy, just after the prisoners. And it singed me. It was that close because it went that way away from me. Singed me because I had side ears and a bit of a tash. Just singed, took it all off. And a few of the other guys got a bit of a roast in as well, but nothing, nothing too great. The, pot, the Pukara pilot was shot down, although he said later that he ditched it. Yeah. And he came floating down into my position. And uh, the guys were shooting at him and some said, no, don't shoot. Because obviously we're paras. We don't want to be, we don't do that shit. So that, even though the fucker had dropped the napalm on us. So anyway, he landed and he landed bang smack in the prisoner's position. And uh, Sid Higginson, who was a sergeant of C Company, uh, RIP now, um, ordered him to pick the uh, the RG up with the no leg. And uh, he didn't, um, he said, no, I'm not going to pick him up. So he got butt stroked. And then he, then Sid pulled out his badge from his flying jacket. Um, then he eventually did pick up this, uh, this, this, this RG, this young lad with the fucking leg gone below the knee. Um, after that, there was still the odd sporadic gunfire going around. Um, still a bit of killing, but most of it had died down. 
I mean, I suppose these days you'd still think that it was still a war going on, but considering what we'd been going through, I mean, it had been a 14 hours since we started on this escapade. And um, it was just unbelievable because it's, it's amazing how, how the human spirit is there and you get strength from, you get strength from achievement. And also it's like a bit, so, you know, courage is courageous. It, 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 it is, sorry, courage is contagious. It's also courageous, but courage is contagious. And uh, that's how we felt. But we, but we realized that we weren't winning this war at all. There's, there was no feeling of adulation and uh, victory. I mean, we had no idea what was going on. We had no idea what our losses were. Um, we had no idea that our mortars, two tubes, fired over 800 rounds in that period. We realized they had no more mortars left. They couldn't get them up. They could not bring them up. Uh, we realized, well, we realized we had no ammunition left because we were using the Argies. They had the same 762, but they had the folding stop SLR which was a better weapon because it's semi-automatic. Um, so, and we had no idea what was going on outside of our own little group, I suppose. Um, as the light faded, so did the gunfire. Um, and then patrols got after the schoolhouse and th there was nothing else for them to do in the sense of point is staying within, mingling with the RG position because you didn't know if they were going to put a counterattack in we didn't really know how much force they had, you know, in um, in the settlement of Goose Green. I mean, we were told by the SAS reports that there was only 400 um, lightly dug in soldiers. Most of them were aircraft technician for the uh, for the Pekaras. Um That's what we were told. But as I said to you before, I've in, subsequently I've interviewed a person that was on those OPs and said, no, we told them what was there. Um, so we, so patrols were then pulled back, back to the, the top of Darwin Ridge. D Company and B Company were still left in position. They had their battles to fight. They fought on Bocker House and all these trenches. And there are some fantastic stories of heroism there. Um, but, you know, that's for another time. Um, then with Recky and myself, I didn't know there was a couple of us around. I didn't know who had been hit. I thought we'd all been killed. Roger Jenner, the OC. Right. Roger Jenner, the OC, who I'll start again. Roger Jenner, the OC, who had been caught out in the initial burst of uh, RG fire, he, his HQ group got absolutely wiped out. Because he wasn't that he wasn't that far down the forward slope, managed to make his way back. He was injured. He had a big shrapnel wound on his shoulder, and he refused to go to the uh, uh, RAP because once you were injured, and that was apparent apparent back on Sussex Mountains. Once you were injured, the the rule was you would go back, you would go to Ajax Bay, then get flown off to one of the casualty boats, ships, and um, you wouldn't you wouldn't come back again. So Roger stayed up on Sussex, uh, stayed up on. Uh, uh, Darwin Hill, um, wanting to know what happened to his company, and uh, Dave Charlie Brown, who who was the clerk for C Company, you know, fully fledged paratrooper, in fact, a classical trained musician actually, should have been a Royal Marine. <laughs> so, <laughs> he went up to uh, he went up to the boss and says, uh, boss. He says, are you all right? You should go and get your shoulder sore. He said, no, no. He said, I've lost my company. I've lost my company. And Charlie says, well, we don't know yet. Boss, do we? We don't know yet. I've lost them. They're all gone. But as patrols slowly made their way back up, Charlie went over to see the boss and says, no, they're coming back. Look, patrols are here. And, you know, Paul Farrow, who's the... Uh, uh, OC patrols turned up and, you know, people started dragging back. And then eventually I made it back up, but not before. Um, we had loads of casualties, you see. And somebody had to look after the front line. A lot of D Company lads came over and looked at the, uh, protected the forward edge of what we, we saw our, our furthest line of exploitation so far. They secured that. 
and we had to get these casualties back. We had loads of casualties. The fucking blokes were just screaming there. Oh, it's just awful, absolutely awful. So we were so desperate to get these guys back. So we found a wheelbarrow and we put Smudge Smith in, who had a big open wound and he was screaming like a stuck pig. So we managed to sort him out. All the Omnipod was gone, the morphine. I mean, you, do, you know, you don't give your own morphine out know, because you might need it. So all the lads and all the medics had used up all the morphine and stuff. So we had all these injured, all these injured to sort out. We had one lad from D Company. I mean, he had a drip. He had a drip in him and he was fucking, he was all over the place. Because when the, when the uh, napalm attack happened, when the fucking napalm came in, he did a runner across over a barbed wire fence and kept on running. He'd been shot three times and he still kept running. So we had to sort him out uh, and loads of others. Anyway, so what happened was um, Paul Grundy, who was uh, Lance Court, who was uh, our radio op for, for, for uh, my patrol in Recce, uh, called up, said, well, you know, we need casualties. And it's dark now. You know, it's dark. F firing's down. The smell of cordite in the air. Bonfire still going off. You know, the gorse is still burning. The wind is whipping up. Smoke everywhere. Um we got these arges all over the place. Somebody quite rightly said, right, move them up. So they walked them up. A couple of lads from C Company walked walk the arges up. You know, there's 20 or 30 of them. And we hadn't really had time to uh, search them all because it was in the middle of, a, middle of a battle. Just thank God none of them did a runner. So they got, they were out the way. And then Paul called up and said, we need, you know, Kazovac. We need Kazovac quick. And um, we said, we can't, the, the, the what same came back because we were C company. We had a different net. We had the battalion net, but we also go back to brigade net. Um, so luckily, a pilot called John Greenoff, scout pilot, who had worked with Tupara in Kenya the year before when Tupara on this trip in Kenya, um, um, heard the call, and he was told, "Not you can't. There's no way you can do. It. You can't fly at night." This. Too, too dangerous, the rounds are going off, you can't do it. You can't go over that, you cannot break the, the ridge into Goose Green. Uh, so John said, fuck it, I'm going. So this other, him and this other pilot, his oppo, a uh, guy called Richard, I think, they took two scouts off, yeah, flew over the ridge, um, so much fire, it drew so much fire, they went back, okay? And then John thought, I'm not, and this bloke's, Paul's on the radio, come on, we need casualties, please, please, we need casualties, over. And John said, right, we're coming. So they, they start flying over again and they're hovering. And then Paul's going, I know this because this is uh, an interview I did with John Greenoff, the pilot. Paul was pleading with him. Please don't go. Please don't go. Charlie won Zulu. Please don't go. You know, stuff like that. So, which was John's call sign. So they come over and they fly past us. And Paul's gone, you've gone too far, you've gone too far. You know, getting all the frigging arges. So they turn around, come back, and then I bought this I bought this uh, scout on, a 110 flash of a camera. And a couple of the other lads had these right-angled torches, you know, uh, the right-angled torches. But uh, I always like to think it was my flash that... And John confirmed it, actually. <laughs> he confirmed I saw the flash. I, I, I said, well, I wasn't sure about flashing because you think it might have been a gun flash or a muzzle flash or something. He landed his scout. Um, they threw a load of uh, ammunition out. And then we bundled Jock, who was in a bad way, Jock Boland, rocket man, we call him, <laughs> um, in a pod because this thing had a pod on. Uh, Smudger went in and all the other wounded, we piled them in. And it was so overladen, this, this helicopter, this scout, that he couldn't take off. And I... I just said to John, what do you mean you couldn't take off? He said, couldn't take off. What you guys did, you all got hold of the skid. And I can't remember this, but John and I've had it, uh, I've had it clarified by a couple of other guys that were there. He said, yeah, we all got, he said, can't you remember, Spud? We all got hold of the skid and we lifted this scout off. And that's what we did. We lifted it off. And it was, these boys were covered in blood and everything. And John got the DFC for that. Mm. Should have got the fucking VC DFC barge, you know. Unbelievable what he did. So that was it. Um, then nighttime came. Then when all the adrenaline rush is gone, you start, you start feeling cold, very cold. Uh, and then you start feeling hungry. All your senses, these senses you don't need at the time, all start coming back to you. 
I mean, your body, your body's been shut down and all it uses is the brain, your sight and your, you know, your senses, certain senses it uses. But when that threat is, is drifted away, other senses come back and hunger is one of them. Um, and we were really hungry. I, I mean, I was all, I was down to, I was down to about 10 rounds of my normal magazine because I got, I got shot in the thigh, which, which, which took a, which took a magazine out. So I pulled it out. I, I stuck the rounds that I could get down my smock. So they were still there. I had some RG, I had, I had the RGFN on that. Um, and I've still got the round. I've still got the, the case in where the round went in. Amazing, isn't it? I stuck it around my uh, um, dog tags. Still got it. Still got it. Don't know how I kept it. I just, it's just one of those things you just, Anything goes down the smock, stays, doesn't it? Because you've got the belt there, <laughs> even your Mars bars and stuff. So yeah, come, come, come. Last night, uh, we eventually made ourselves. We sort of walked back up, 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 up the hill towards Darwin Ridge. Um, very, very cautious because we weren't sure. There was no password. We we didn't know about a password, and um, you know the guys are twitchy, of course. And it's, a, it's dark, but we just assumed and hoped that they would notice us. Uh, we so we managed to go up there, and, and I slept in the burning, burning, the burning gorse. We didn't sleep; just sat there, sat in this in this gorse. Excuse me, we all sat in the gorse, absolutely bollocked. None of us slept. Got a bit of a scoff on. Got a brew on. It's amazing what a brew does, isn't it? You could be in the most shitty situation anywhere. But you you got a you got a fresh hot brew on and it's beautiful, and then we did that and then um, we we weren't even we couldn't even have we didn't even have the effort to talk, we just we were just so fucking fucked, but but we were ready for the morning, we were ready for the counterattack, we were ready to go in there, we were ready to go in again. I mean it was just it was the way it was. It's just the way it was. Morning came, and um, I hadn't didn't know what was being plotted during the during the early hours. But Chris Keeble had managed to get a couple of RG prisoners, um, and then trying to out surrender. And uh, of course, um, they went to take the surrender. Terms of surrender were worked out on the airfield, and um, the battalion. Marched into, uh, not marched, we sort of, you know, patrolled into uh, into Goose Green. Um, I mean, because we were fucked, C Company were absolutely fucked. B Company had to hold their position. A Company had to hold their position. D Company had to hold their position. Um, so it was only the HQ elements and the uh, and Chris Keeble that went into Stanley to take the surrender, followed by us. We came in a bit later. And um, all that jubilation. I'm, I'm not knocking the lads. You see those famous pictures of Ken Lakoviak and Hank Hood, God rest his soul, cracking medic, took his life a few years ago because of the horrors of war, drinking the whiskey that the locals had given him. I mean, I've asked about these to guys that were with me at the time. I said, we were so bollocks. We just, we just wanted to sleep. You know, we couldn't, although... It would have been nice. It, it wasn't even it wasn't even in my vocab to to, to socialise. I mean, I was so wound up, like the rest of us. We were killing machines. We we were just fucking awful, awful young men, fucking awful. And that's what it is. But fair play to Ken and uh, to, to Hank and the rest of the boys drinking. You know, and Hank had a real shit war. I mean, he was patching up his mates. He was he patched up a lot of his mates. In fact, we, they actually found this guy called Steve Tuffin, who I mentioned earlier. He was one of the first to go missing on the attack on Darwin Hill with A Company. He got shot, bang, straight in the head. Fucking square on in the brain. And he, he laid there for eight hours. He was the first to get shot and he was last to get Kazavakt. And Hank gave him the last rights. And Hank said to him, he said, Steve, if you don't, because he'd already been given like two, two syringes of morphine and you don't give a head wound that. But Hank knew. Well, he'd given him one, I think, for, for another wound he had. And Hank said, Steve, if you don't squeeze my hand, I'm going to give you another morphine. 
and then Steve squeezed his hand to let to let Hank know that he was still compass mentors because poor Steve was in a bad way. Yeah, he was the last to get Kazabacked. Um, yeah, so that's Hank did a lot of good things and took his own life a few years ago. We we went to his funeral. Um, held the church the church up at uh, North Wales held 900, and there was 1300 Airborne Brotherhood from all over the world turned up, all in the car park. And then the strange thing was, after day two of the wake on the Sunday, we were all in Hank's local pub, and then it all started off again, didn't it? The Scousers, two para Scousers against Northern Ireland, the boys from Northern Ireland, just like it was three, just like it was 35, 40 years ago, you know, in the Naffy. All started kicking off. And I went, oh, I said to my mate Neil, I said, and Duke turned up as well. I said, come, let's go back to the hotel, leave these fuckers to get on with it. You know, it hadn't changed in 35 years. Uh, the same old, the, you know, the same old sort of quarrels and characters that always want to fight with people. Crazy. But yeah, so that's where we were um, with Goose Green. We had a C company were moved into the uh, Procara Pilots bashers, which happened to be the sheep shearing accommodation during the sheep shearing season. And we'd moved into the Procara Pilots, Procara Pilots bashers, and they had shit everywhere. They had shit in the beds, fucking floor, cut the water off, done absolutely everything. Dirty bastards. Um, but yeah, that was it. That was well, well, it was a welcome rest for us. I know a company never made it into Goose Green because they had to, they had to keep the, they had to watch the back. They had to be on Darwin Hill all the time, you know, as the outer cordon. Um, yeah. So that that was Goose Green. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at what point in this did you learn that Colonel H had been killed? Yeah. Um, we were advancing behind, yeah, we were advancing after the initial mortar where we went firm. We got a brew on at the base of Darwin Hill. That's when it came down, sun ray, sun ray down, you know. But it didn't really affect me. But what it did do, it affected my boss, who was uh, Lieutenant Connor, Colin Connor. I mean, he started crying. And then Ken had to get a grip of him and say, fucking hell, boss, you know, start switching on, will you? I mean, we were old sweats. We were like 20, 21, <laughs> you know. I mean, rifle companies had 18, 17, 18-year-olds. It's Tom's. And, and if that happened in a rifle company, I mean, it wouldn't she, the poor old Tom would have been well fucked off, wouldn't he? Because we were the old sweats, it didn't really affect us that much. But I was shocked to see the bloke crying. I mean, you do your crying after. You don't do it in front of your men, do you? <clears throat> Um, yeah, that's when we heard when Jones got it. Didn't affect me um, because you can't let emotions like that get in to your head. You sort all that shit out later. I mean, I sorted that shit out later and I was lucky in the sense because of war on point. You don't mope about it if you're still on ops. You know, you get over it, you know, when you're in a safe environment. You know, and you get over it, you deal with it yourself. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm really pleased that Chris Keeble took over. He did an absolutely stupendous job because when we when we went into Stanley, uh, when we sorry when we went into Goose Green, I couldn't believe they kept coming. The Argies kept coming, and they were told to march out with their hands with their r r rifle in one hand, the other hand held high, march out and drop all their weapons. They came out one, two, three, twenty, fifty, hundred. One at 200, 300, four, five, six. Fuck, there, were, there was almost 1,200 that came out. And those famous pictures of those helmets and those rifles on the, on the field just outside Goose Creek. And not only that, the Bacaras were still on the airfield. The ones that could fly off took off. Uh, they were the ones that bombed us. And then they obviously flew back somewhere, probably back to Stanley. Um, and then when we saw the hardware they had, they had canisters of napalm all sweating and smelly. They had these, like I said, these Beaufort guns they'd taken off the ships. The, air, the airfield was surrounded by these Orlikan guns, 20 and 30 mil cannons, rapid fire, which took out our HQ. Uh, yeah, I mean, they could have held us for a long, long time. Mm. Yeah. So, um, 
I think I'll speak on behalf of everybody listening that wasn't there. It's uh, it's almost beggar's belief, doesn't it? Well, I, I look back at it now and I go, so many heroic deeds have been done by our fathers and our grandfathers and our great grandfathers and mothers and, you know, grandmothers. That I see this as just my war. And I spoke to the guys up in the regiment, up here in the SAS, blokes that have done their, finished their 22 years. I've mean, done three times more time up here than they've done in the Paris. And they will always say, even stuff in Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, all over the place, nothing, nothing compares to Goose Green, nothing. And these are proper, proper full hard on soldiers. Nothing compares to Goose Green. Nothing they've done in the SES compares. Because what, what you do in the SES is very much controlled. You've got all the support. I know you're out on a limb, but it's a bit of a it's a bit fun driving a motorbike or a pinky over in the desert. Do you know what I mean? Because you can hit and run. You hit the hit the enemy, you can fucking run off laugh. Um, that's what people don't understand. They think it's more guy behind enemy lines is yeah, it's 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 not it's not a good thing. But you do have the ability to uh, do your own thing and plan your escape. Being full on in a battle, you can't. You've got you've got one way to go. You should only go one way, mm. you know. Or you do a tactical advance or tactical retreats. <laughs> right, you've got to ask me. Um, ask me about the book. Bring me the arse of Saddam. Yes, yeah, so come on. That's uh, you literally did apparently. <laughs> yeah, I was a. Uh, I was working out of Kuwait um, just before Gulf War Two, and um, I got the suspicion that. Uh, uh, the coalition forces were going to actually invade or liberate Iraq. And uh, basically I got, I was a photojournalist and uh, I got all my accreditations and basically I, I followed the U S Marine Corps up into Baghdad over a three week period. A friend of mine who had spent, uh, left the SES after 20 odd years, JY, who, who was the lad way back in the Falklands that shouted spud during the mortar attack where that piece of shrapnel almost hit my femur. Uh, it was him. So he was, he was, uh, he was running the, uh, the first, uh, the first contract Olive security ever had. And uh, which was to look after the sky news team in, in, during the war. And uh, I, I just went on with Jay White as another security guy but I could file my copy back using their um, SAT system, SAT and communication system. So, um, yeah, we we ended up in Al Nazaria, which was the biggest battle um, during the war uh, of Iraq, Gulf War II. Um, we got hosted really well by the US Marine Corps, really impressed, really impressed with their um, patriotism, their professionalism, and the kit they had is just oh, awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, um, and someone like me who's a who's a truck just he had so many beautiful heavy plant and uh, you know for, forget the war I was just like all and uh, I was just like all oh, I was full of emotion looking at these big vehicles you know these six six wheel drive vehicles uh, they also flew the uh, they, they they flew the the uh, uh, Huey gunship um, and at the time they they they, they flew the CH forty seven. It's the CH forty six, isn't it? The CH forty seven is the is what they call the frog, which is a smaller version of the of the Chinook. Mm -hmm. Vietnam Day as well. They've actually stopped flying them now, but it's nice to see them. In Al Nazaria, I was um, I was protected by Old Spooky Puff the Magic Dragon, which is that C one thirty gunship with a one hundred five howitzer, short howitzer outside the, out of the port door. Um, set of Vulcan guns on the front. That was that was a good feeling. Um, I then went and saw the uh, the um, G battery of uh, 7RHA. They came up to support the American Marines, first time since the Second World War in Nail Nazaria. They had, a, they had a, uh, um, a line of guns up there. And the guy that was two IC of the guns was a guy that was a Tom on, with 2-9 Commando back on Wireless Ridge, which was, which was the second battle I was involved in with the Falklands. And he, he was on the gun, gun line there. And it was after 
it was after the Battle for Wireless Ridge, and I told this chap, he was a captain back in Iraq, I said to him, after the Battle for Wireless Ridge, when you guys pummeled Wireless Ridge, I said, I'd never call an artillery man a crapper ever again. <laughs> so we had a good night there. Then we moved on, and eventually I found myself um, a few hours later after they'd pulled the statue down in, in Ferdor Square. Um, managed to get a piece of... Uh, uh, a piece of the bronze. I only wanted a small piece, you know, the size of a fag packet. Um, but I ended up getting his left buttock, which is quite a big piece, um, and managed to get it back home. And a few years for a second divorce, and the house has to be cleared. So I found this thing in the golden shed and thought, what the hell can I do with it? Um, so I thought, well, it would be nice because at the time, Girls and boys were still coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, fucked up in all sorts of, oh, it's awful, awful. These wars, these unjust and illegal wars, it, it grips me. Chris, it really does. It grips me. They were all coming back to Birmingham. So I thought it would be a great idea to sell the arse to raise money for the Royal Centre of Defence Medicine up in Birmingham and also the Wounded Warriors Programme, which is the USMC programme in the States. Um, Went to sell it, uh, went to sell it at auction, um, went to sell it, went put it at 25 grand. It, and then I, I took advice from uh, an auctioneer guy, a friend, a friend of a friend over in uh, Dubai. He said, no, he said, that's worth that. that you need to put 250,000. So that's, I put 250,000 reserve on it. And that's when my trouble started. Uh, the police then jumped on my back. Uh, I, I got... Um, Bailed seven times. I've got arrested, bailed seven times. They wanted the arse. They wouldn't tell me who wanted the arse. Uh, it it, it kind of went worldwide. Bit of a funny story, really, because of because it was his left buttock of Saddam Hussein. And, and I've written a book about it, and it's called Bring Me the Arse of Saddam. Um, it's been well received, not by, not by the government, the establishment. I'm still trying to find out who made the complaint. My barrister said it's not a criminal act. It's nothing to do with them. They should, if they need to prosecute me, they should take me through the civil courts and then we'll see who's put in the complaint. So, yeah, it's Bring Me the Arse of Saddam. What, what it's a happened, funny book. It's what funny. happened to it? Did, did you ever manage to sell it? No, it's... Um, the police asked me, where is it? I said, well, I don't know. I gave it to Gypsy Pete. They said, where's, they said, where's Gypsy Pete? And I said, well, he gave it to Ken the Nose. And Ken the Nose said it's on the run. <laughs> it did. I did take it for its last tour around London. Managed to smuggle it into the Damien Hurst Golden Skulls exhibition. So in the book, there's a picture of it there. <laughs> you know, it's up there between the Golden Skulls. Um, yeah, took it all around London. I mean, the police went apeshit. Almost a hundred thousand pounds of taxpayers' money, um, and they've they actually they actually put a press release out saying we don't believe it's it's the real arse we believe that it's uh, you know Nigel Ely is fraudulent making fraudulent claims this is the arse See, they're trying to they're trying to sort of get me to come out and say so I mean I've been told that if the arse does raise its ugly head um, they will come down on me like a ton of bricks again can you believe it um, so yeah it's up for sale um, I've tried to get hold of the Iraqi government, but they've obviously got more pressing uh, things to do. But the reason why I think the complaint was made, um, because I think they realised how much money it was. Some apparatchik in the, in the Iraqi government said to the British government, I want this, this is uh, um, cultural property, because that's, that's what I got arrested under. United Nations Section 8 uh, to, of, two, of the 2003 Iraqi Cultural Property Act, knowingly taking or stealing Iraqi cultural property. So that they've gone on me, this United Nations thing. So, um, yeah, I've tried to uh, get hold of the Iraqis. They won't have it. Try to get hold of the ambassador, his first secretary in London. They keep back away. Nobody knows who made the complaint. Um, it's a big load of bullshit, but it's a cracking story. I enjoyed writing it. It's funny as fuck. And also... Um, the, the arse is still for sale, but they have threatened, the police have threatened, if it does, like I say, raise, it, raise its ugly head, then uh, they'll, come and, they'll come and get me again. 
you'll nick me old beauty. So I said, I did offer them a compromise. I said, they said, give it to the uh, lost property, police sergeant lost property, and then we'll take it from there. I said, no, I'll tell you what we'll do. You charge me. We'll go to magistrate's court. Magistrate will not be able to deal with it. We'll go to Crown Court. I'm prepared to go to Crown Court with this. They won't do it. So there's obviously some skullduggery. Mm. That's a right riveting read. <laughs> <laughs> if you, we could do the film again next time, or what? Yeah, wanna... well, I just wanted to ask you about Olive Security because my one of my um, best mates in the Marines was killed working for them in oh. Mosul. Oh dear! Yeah, a chap called Andy. Um, really? And, oh, I'm really uh, sorry. Yeah, well, it's you know, live by the sword, die by the sword, don't you? It's it's it's, it's the way of the warrior. Um, but it is a bit of a surprise when it's like the most alpha male guy you know. Yeah. Who always is up, you know, he's always going to be doing something like that. And the next thing you you see him lying dead on an Iraqi street, it's... Uh, awful. I mean, it's uh, just... It yeah. is awful. Spud, what about this film then? I wrote a screenplay uh, about my experiences in Goose Green. Um, and it's the second screenplay I've, I've, uh, I've, I've written. And... Um, I was doing a talk on war, believe it or not, to a load of old soldiers up in London. And uh, it was in Soho, so there was a lot of arty farties about. And um, in the audience, after I'd sort of waffled, waffled on, there was this guy called John Irvin, who's a Geordie lad, but he's a Hollywood producer, director. Uh, he's he done, uh, done Robin Hood and uh, Hamburger Hill is probably the famous war movie he's done. Mm. So he said to me, Spud, he said, uh, well done. Thanks very much for turning up and giving a talk. And then I sort of pushed my script and he said, well, I'd like to see it. And I thought, well, OK, I'll, I'll send it off, you know, and uh, not expecting to hear anything back. But within about 10 days, he came back and said, yeah, I want to do this. And that was brilliant. I mean, that was fantastic for him to say that. We, are, we have been in, we have been looking. We want to film it in the UK. We want to film it in Wales, down at Brecon. Uh, Sunny Bridge, actually, Sunny Lager down there. Um, there's three main characters. There's the, the, there's um, Colonel Jones, VC, who we've got in as a cameo role. Uh, there's Major Chris Keeble, who took over from Jones for the battalion, and, and, and of course there's me because I've written the I've written the script around my 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 eyes. Um, we we did have uh, we, we had Henry Cavill, his people look at it because I fancied him playing Chris Keeble. Uh, and we haven't heard anything back. I think he's production company, only because I thought he'd, maybe his brother been in the Marines. Is that right? Is he in the Royal Marines? Um, or was? I, I think he's just very passionate about the Royal Marines. It's, it's Henry, isn't it, his brother? Right. He, he, Henry Cavill. No, Henry, Henry is the actor. He's the Superman guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's the Superman. Yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> um yeah but but yeah no he's um he wears like the globe and laurel on his lapel and stuff Does like he, that. yeah i've seen him do stuff like that well i'd love to get a message out any royal marines out there that have a link or anything um for jones i thought i kind of liked uh tom hardy um but he's very hard to get hold of as well and obviously the actors we did have uh, because of COVID now we're still negotiating stuff and we, we, we hope to move into pre-production um, June, July this year, because that's when they're going to lift the restrictions. Uh, we were going to go overseas to Estonia or regard, uh, Bulgaria to, to film it, but um, because of COVID, but now it seems to, we seem to be getting on top of COVID and uh, yeah. And we still want to shoot it in the UK and hopefully it'll be out um, October, uh, next year the 40th anniversary is may and i think september october next year it'd be great if it comes out and it'll be a cracking war movie you know let's fingers crossed anyway um, yes it's um not not an awful lot of films have been made about the falklands have they in that respect no. the, the um the story of captain robert lawrence was the left 
lieutenant back then who was the chap who sh got shot in the head on tumble down tumble down yeah yeah we're, um, we're, we're on the phone to each other at the moment with respect right, to him cool. coming on the show okay, um, incredible feature they did incredible feature that tumble down yeah very powerful we've up, we've been up yeah yeah but mostly yeah. mostly about him when he came home wasn't it so it wasn't actually yeah then there was the um an ungentlemanly act which was the original or the very first invasion of the Falklands before the actual war. So that was the right. Royal Marines 8901 party who, who All right, yeah. put up a bit of a scrap. Yeah. Um, we've, again, we've I've, um, chatted about that on the podcast uh, with Ricky Phillips, who, who wrote a book about it. Um, but as far as sort of, a film about the actual nitty gritty yeah. attacking at, at night and, and this kind of thing. I don't think a lot's been no. done, has it? Well, yeah, Goose Green, nothing on Goose Green. And and um, remember, it was uh, we needed a victory because the, the, the from what I saw with the Navy and everybody being bogged down on the beach, the Navy, the poor bastards. Oh, oh the Sheffield, when they had those uh, aluminium steps to get out of and it all melted because they, they needed the they, they they balanced off speed for weight didn't they oh just jesus it's just so embarrassing so hopefully goose green um excuse me i'll just see that. yeah hopefully goose green will encompass everyone it's not just about the paras you know it's about war it's about a, a, a group of guys in war um and it tells the story of goose green which still to this day is Still, the bloodiest, biggest battle the British armies fought independently, and it was the first victory. It was the first victory, and I think, you know, victory is contagious. And I think with with that, it was the catalyst which forced the momentum to, for the for everyone, for the Royal Marines, for three para, for you know the Navy and everybody to to get on because a lot of a lot of the headsheds didn't want Goose Green to happen. I think Sandy Woodward said, "Oh, it's just a sideshow." Well, what he didn't understand, and he was the admiral, what he didn't understand was the men and women needed a vo moral victory. Mm. They needed that. You know, he could have left them there, left all those Bukharas there, and they could have bombed us from behind. But, um, yeah. Spud, how many books have you written now? It's quite a few, isn't it? Or at yeah. least a few in the offing. Yeah, yeah I've written um, Fight for Queen and Country, which was a bastardization of Terminal, which had updated uh, Terminal Velocity. Uh, no Fear, Gun for Hire, um, Bring Me the Arse of Saddam. And I've now written, and it's pub it'd be published next year, um, Goose Green, Uncensored Voices. And it's, a, it's not a blood and guts book. I mean, you can get that in Fighting for Queen and Country, or you can get that in a blood and guts book. It's about the blokes' experiences, the civvies, the civilians' experiences, the ship, the, the, the crew on board the Norland. It's all little vignettes, little anecdotal stories, funny stories, sad, some sad, and some indifferent. And it's a collection of well over 100. And it's an easy read. You know, it's a sort of thing you can pick the book up, read a couple of funny stories, put it down. And I haven't interviewed anybody above the rank of captain. Mm. And the only person I have done is major Chris Cable because one has to do that if you're talking about Battle for Goose Green. But all the officers all the officers and men are all below the rank, captain or below. Um, so it'd be out. Major publisher, Bonnier, Bonnier Publishing UK, um, due out, well, hopefully, for the um, for the anniversary of Goose Green. How they run it, I'm, I'm not sure. They probably, they might run it a couple of weeks before the anniversary or a month. But yeah, that's a signed and sealed um, the book I'm working on at the moment is Living in the Country, an old soldier living in the country, you know, in an isolated cottage, growing his own vegetables. Um, I've got a passion for British cars, sort of post-World War II, mainly 60s cars. I've got a couple of them. I've got a couple of Rover P4s, you know, with the suicide doors. I've got a Morris Traveller. I got, the, the one I've got on the road, the Rover I've got on the road is called Bert, and the Morris Traveller which is a 1970 one, one of the last. Yeah, it's the Woody. 
I call yeah. that tra yeah. Trav. Oh, it's beautiful. They put a smile on my face. People think I'm a lunatic around here. I drive around Hereford, smiling, big smile on my face. Always, always positive in life. I think one has to be positive in life. Um, I'm so grateful. Uh, I'm so grateful for my life. Um, I lost, I lost my brother um, three years ago, very quickly through cancer. And I apologize to anybody who bought the book. If there's a few editorial mistakes in it, they've been, it's been changed now, but I had to get it out and I had to see him hold it mm. before he passed. So my apologies to anybody that's, that's read the book, bought it, read it and think there's too many mistakes. Well, I agree there, there is, but there isn't now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very positive in life. I think you have to be. I, I think I, I, my daughter says I've been through a lot. I, I consider it just the way it is. Um, I'm grateful for every day I get up. I've actually looked after my health a lot better than what I did years ago. I think that's so important as, as we get on, as we start pushing middle age. Um, and I think you've got to keep smiling. I think you've got to keep smiling, be positive. My glass is always half full. I fucking can't stand these doom and gloom merchants. I can't stand them. Um, I think life's for living and I think you've got, just got to get on with it. And I'm, you know, I'm really positive about lots of things. And like I say, this book I'm doing at the moment, sort of, it's a, it's a living off grid type thing, but it's just a, it's just an old soldier, old paratrooper, SAS guy, call it what you want, special forces, all well, the terms they put these people now. It's just amazing, isn't it? You know, oh, look at me, SF. Um, and I'm just crack on. I, uh, in order to keep fit, I, um, I cut wood. I don't climb anymore, but I knock trees down for farmers, tidy them up, uh, do a bit of firewood, um, and I really enjoy it. In fact, after this, uh, after this uh, chat, I'm going to go out. I've got about two ton of logs to round up. And um, I've, well, the exciting thing in my life, the end of this week, I'm getting a new chainsaw. <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it. I get yes. new, new steel two six one. Uh, my old one's gone. I've got several chainsaws, but this is quite a, a, a nice little chainsaw. Well, it's a professional middle of the road chainsaw that can do a lot of work with it. So I'm quite looking forward to having a play with that at the weekend. Hey, that's a milestone. <laughs> when you get a chainsaw, when you, when you have a bonfire on the Sunday, that's the first milestone. You made it to adulthood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I was in the SES, I was on the team, on the counter. Uh, uh, terrorist team um, I was the MOE man method of entry man and back then we used to have the steels and the way say when you had um, you had to aircraft you know you managed to get an aircraft down and you had to assault an aircraft my job was to get the old steel cutter and cut through cut a panel through the uh, fuselage oh we must have been fucking crazy back then yes. um, and of course that's when I got into it all yeah <laughs> Well, Spud, all I can say, well, I can say a lot, but all I will say is uh, I'm glad you made it through all of this. Thank you for your um, uh, your input and bravery on behalf of our great nation. Um, mm. And are you going to come back and talk to us again? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I, I you know, and thank you for your compliments and thank you for the invite. Um, I. Yeah, I, 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 we can talk about what I'd like to do is talk about because Bring Me the Arse of Saddam was a book I self published myself. I went through the whole, I learned a lot about publishing through it. You know, I could have got it through a mainstream publisher, but I thought I'd have a go at trying to do it myself. Spud, anyway, listen, oh. stay on the line and we can continue okay. the chat. But on behalf of the Bought the T shirt podcast, massive thank you for. For, for your commitment and, and for joining us today. And I'll, I'm going to put all your links below. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Welcome. And to everybody at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourself. Thank you for watching another edition. And if you can like and subscribe, then I will like you. <laughs> ciao, 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 ciao.